and Melody generally starts this, and I used to be the one to start this, and she's going to briefly go over this information in her presentation, but basically there have been some house bills and Senate bills that have been passed that require um, suicide prevention training for staff and activities for kids. So what we're doing today is um, the required two-hour training for staff, and I've gone ahead and tag along with this our suicide prevention policies and procedures for the district, as well as our threat assessment policies and procedures, and also abuse reporting. A lot of time they kind of go together, and whenever you're dealing with one of those issues, you're dealing with others. So we just kind of tie it together, and it gives me time to meet with you guys and not have to make you stay after school another day to go over this stuff. Real fast, we'll start with the suicide risk information. Um, basically, if you have a student in your class that says that they're going to hurt themselves or having thoughts of hurting themselves, you want to contact an administrator, well, one of the counselors actually, or if you can't get a hold of them, one of the administrators so that they can get a hold of a counselor or school psychologist. You want to do it as quickly and discreetly as you can because sometimes there's a lot of meetings we have to do with the kids. We have to get parents here. We have to get them somewhere else. So the more time of the day that you can give us that allow that information for, for us to be able to do everything that we need to do. So if something happens in third period, don't wait until seventh period and then as soon as the kids are released say, oh yeah, I just wanted to let you know that little Joey came up to me today and he was saying that he was really depressed and all these things are going on at home and dad has a gun and I'm really worried about it because he knows how to get to it and we just let him go home on a bus, nobody's supervising him, he's going home to an empty house. Because as soon as that happens, we have to call the bus, they have to bring all the kids back to school, we have to pull the kid, we have to get the parent in, and we're here till 5 or 6 o'clock at night meeting with people. We cannot let a child go home unsupervised that has, been, has said that they're going to do something to themselves. So I just want you all to be aware of that. Also, I want you to be aware, and they have found school staff liable and partially responsible if a child tells you something and you don't report it and something happens to the child, you can be held partially liable or responsible. So I do want to make you aware of that. Any questions about our suicide procedures, suicide, whenever a kid says that they want to hurt them? Oh yeah, something else I do want to tell you. Sometimes kids come up to us and will say something like, um, I really need to talk to you about something, but you have to promise me you're not going to tell anybody. And so what I always tell kids if they come up and say something like that to me is um, if you tell me that you're going to hurt yourself or you've got thoughts of or you plan to hurt somebody else or somebody is hurting you, we have to tell other people. It's my job to keep everyone safe and so we have to notify other people. So basically if a kid says that they're thinking about hurting themselves or you hear conversations in your classroom and you get concerned, call either of the school counselors or call me we'll come get the kid. We don't want them wandering the hallway alone either if they can go into a bathroom and do something to themselves. We'll come get them, we'll meet with them, figure out what's going on, and get the student whatever care they need. Any questions about those procedures? Okay, threat assessment is essentially the same. Um, the only difference is that it's when a child makes a threat against someone else. So if they're telling you they're going to hurt someone else, they've got plans to hurt someone else, the only difference with this is that the, your first job is to report it to an administrator because they're the ones to determine if it's a disciplinary issue. And so it goes through them first. They make the determination if we need to do a threat assessment. And usually, and they'll just call us and a lot of times the school resource officer is involved with that. So threat assessment is any time a kid says that they want to hurt an individual person or an identifiable group of people. That's when you immediately report it to an administrator. Um, let's see. So sometimes kids will say things like, oh my gosh, I'm so mad at my mom I could just kill her. She won't let me do such and such. Well, that's just a saying that people say. And probably you might go up to the kid and maybe teach them something more appropriate to say, but they probably don't actually mean something like that. So just be aware, take things into context, try to read kids' body language. If you seriously feel like a child is gonna hurt some, somebody else or they have a plan to, 
you need to tell somebody as soon as possible because the same thing can happen. If a kid or you overhear something in second period and there's going to be a fight in seventh period and something, somebody seriously ends up getting hurt and you knew that this was coming and didn't do anything, then you can also be held liable or accountable for that. Any questions about threat assessments? And I've already kind of said this. Um, it's a whole team that gets involved. Usually it's an administrator, um, school resource officer, assistant principals, school psychologists, counselors. Lots of people are usually involved in these when it's a serious issue. Any questions what to, about what to do with threat assessments? Okay. The last thing that we'll talk about, and I went on ahead and kept this PowerPoint just because there is a lot of information and I don't want to have to read it all to you. So I figure you guys can just kind of follow along. Does everyone know that as a teacher or a school employee, you are considered to be a mandatory reporter? Does anyone not know that or was not aware of that? Does everyone know what that means to be a mandatory reporter? What are you reporting? So any, any type of abuse that you suspect. You don't have to know for sure it's going on. You just have to suspect that something is going on. And these laws were put into place to protect um, children and vulnerable adults and spouses. So we're going to talk about all these different types of abuse so that you know what they are, know what to, you're looking for how to make a report, and then the school policies and procedures for making the reports. All these people are mandatory reporters, so you can see people that work in the medical field, teachers, mental health professionals, peace officers, police officers. And then this is the definition of neglect and some examples of neglect. I do want to let you know that a lot of times this is an issue that comes up. We'll have kids who haven't bathed in a couple weeks, they've been wearing the same clothing for a couple weeks, um, and a lot of times we feel like, well, somebody's not taking care of them, and so we'll make a report to social services, and a lot of times they'll tell us, well, that's a lifestyle choice. And so unless it's really bad, a lot of times they don't investigate, but I do want you, I want you to be aware of that in case nothing comes of it, but I also want you to report if you have serious concerns. It has to be a caregiver for abuse to be considered abuse, otherwise it's a domestic issue. And so these people would be considered caregivers. Here are some examples of physical abuse. Sexual abuse, the definition and some examples. Emotional or psychological abuse. And now we've already kind of talked about this, but who must report? Anybody that works in the school system is required to report if you suspect any kind of abuse. These are all the agencies or places that you can make a report to. Um, I know the counselor at the intermediate school really likes doing the online reporting. I prefer to do uh, to make a phone call to make the reports just to make sure I make contact with someone and I answer any questions that they may have. The law requires anyone who knows, suspects, or has reasonable cause to believe that a child is neglected or abused to be reported. And then sometimes people are like, well, but what if it's not really happening? Well, the law protects you as long as you're making that report in good faith and you're not trying to do something inappropriate, nothing's going to happen to you. Also, I know sometimes you want to ask more questions and try to do some investigating yourself, and this can mess up whatever somebody else has to come in and do later. You can put ideas or thoughts or something into somebody, and so let the professional who's doing the investigation, that's their job, let them do the investigation and you just report it if you suspect something. 
I tell kids the exact same thing I do with suicide risk assessment and threat assessment. If you tell me that you've got plans, that you're thinking of hurting yourself, somebody else, or if somebody is hurting you, I can't keep it confidential. There are a lot of times we've had situations where kids have begged and pleaded and you just can't do it. And again, you just explain to them that it's your job to try to help keep them safe. There are um, some penalties and it is considered a crime if you don't report and you are a mandatory reporter. <coughs> also, we've kind of talked about this, if you fail to make a report and something happens to a child and you knew it or suspected it, then um, if it's well known and you've told other people about it and they find out, then you can be held partially responsible if something happens to that child. Also, if the child tells you or if you're the one seeing something or suspecting it, you have to be the one to make the report. You can't tell your administrator and then they make it for you because they, they want to know what did you see, what did the child tell you, and they can't report it second, you can't report it second hand. So it has to come from you and you would go make this report with the administrator. When you go to make the report, you're going to have to have a lot of information, so you have to have IC up. They're going to ask the age of the child, the address, phone numbers, who else is living in the house, the ages of the other people living in the house. Um, if they feel like they're probably going to be making a home visit, they'll ask you questions like, are there weapons in the house? Are there vicious animals in the house? They'll ask all kinds of questions. So a lot of times I'll say, I just, I have no idea, and I don't, if you don't know, you just tell them you don't know. This is some information that you may want to keep track of if you want. Whenever you make a report, you don't have to. You can also ask them when you're finished giving all the information, is this a report that's going to be accepted or not? And they'll give you a number that you can call back within 24 hours to determine if it has been accepted. And that means they're looking into things or checking on things. We've already kind of talked about the school policies and procedures. You want to notify somebody as soon as possible so that we can make that report because um, social services may not want that child going home. They may need to come here to meet with them or see them first if, if something is going on. So just be aware the earlier in the day, the better so that we can catch things as fast as possible. Any questions about abuse reporting? The last thing I want to say about it is that we had an issue a couple of years, it was like a year or two after I started, and um, a teacher had reported it and made a, um, a, a report to the administrator, but they didn't make contact with that person. They sent them an email or left a message on an answering machine, and that administrator didn't get to it for almost a week, because I think it was during a break. And so no calls were made, nothing had happened, and um, it was a serious abuse situation. And I think that that child had confided in that adult, they had reported it, the child felt like something was gonna happen, and nothing happened for like a week because nobody knew about it because the report wasn't actually made. So I just, I wanna make you aware that once you make a report, to don't do it by email, don't leave somebody a message, Go make face-to-face -face contact so that you can make sure it's taken care of. Any other questions? All right, I'm going to give it to Melody. Mr. Beer. <laughs> Microphone, as you can tell. I don't even know how close to hold it to my mouth. 
Mr. Gear. I want to get a day. You want sound? You want sound on the platform? Okay. before I need the sound anyway. I'm using a Prezi thanks to Miss Kim Hilton, so please bear with me if something that was fine. <laughs> Thank you. 
please forward it fast till about till I tell you to stop. Keep going, please. Keep going. Wait a minute, stop. back up a little bit. I'm sorry, Mr. Garrow. Back up. A little bit more. A little bit more. A little bit more. <laughs> right there. That's cool. Basically, like Mark said, tore a hole in our family. Just a, that's such a devastating loss. All the questions started swirling around like, what do I say? What do I don't say? Do we do a memorial? Uh, how do I tell the students? How do I talk to the parents? What do I say to the press? At that point in time, we brought in some different psychologists and social workers, as well as our school counselors, a couple of counselors from the district, and had three counselors trained. And our students were upset. Um, those who knew her well were very upset. Those who knew her by association or by you know, being in class with her. Then we were in my wildest dream that I have thought we'd face it again. Almost six months to the day, uh, Rachel, good friend Kristen, took her life also. And at that point, and that's when my personal world started to fall apart. And I realized, uh, I don't have a grasp on what I should be doing. I don't think. I, I felt we'd done a lot of good things and handled things right. We would be in the office and there would be parents coming in saying, you know, what do we do? What is going on? How would I know? You know, because my friend didn't know and that happened to their child. And at that point, we went outside as a mental health professional. We wanted to sell in counties, um, mental health services in Bullock County to help with us. We brought other people from around the state that had some background and suicide prevention. And we would say, these are some steps you ought to take, this is what you ought to do, you probably don't want to do this. And then went forward with a more formalized plan of how to reach students, parents, community. We helped cover classes if needed, except for teachers that you know had experience or had relationships with students who work with students. Or we actually talked with students ourselves about the support in that since we had you know, a counseling background at a school counseling degree. We set up a mentoring buddy system after our, after our first suicide. We focused on the close group of friends surrounding Rachel. After the second suicide, we realized that it's technical or further out into the school and into the community. I think the staff really just tried to wrap their arms around the students and tried to be there for support for them. Um, of course, at some point, they've got to take care of themselves too. And my faculty brought in training for TPR, for collection, persuasion, refer for all of our faculty to be able to identify a student who might be in crisis and be able to ask a difficult question, are you thinking of killing yourself? And then knowing how to persuade them to get help and, and who to refer them to. We trained about 80% of our faculty uh, in that strategy, as well as just having some education about suicide itself. Every year, kids go to different schools, and one of our students uh, chose to go to uh, another school in the district. And then, six months from the date of Kristen's death, uh, she committed suicide as well. This never, ever will be the same for my family, my boys, her brothers, and her friends. 
wish I would have seen the warning signs. Wish I could have saved her. It hit me at that time that we had a lot of things in place at our school, but there were 20 other schools just in Bowen County alone. And it started to hit me more of a global perspective that you can't just have one little pocket doing something. These kind of programs need to be in every single school. I've been a principal for a while and had lots of deaths of students to car accidents and have never had a suicide before. And it was a very difficult experience uh, because of all the different factors that came into play in the community and within the school. And it was the beginning of what seemed to be uh, a series of suicides in Grand County. Uh, it was like they were happening almost every, every six months. You get to wondering, well, was there something that I could have done? What should I have known to be prepared for this? And then you go through the phase as a principal of wondering, what do I need to do to help my staff to know how to see the signs and how to let us know when things happen? And it's just, you go through a lot of anxiety, a lot of frustration. Uh, you cry a lot. You know, in, in school, it's, we have plans for everything. Binders on my desk for every safety plan. No other mankind. We have soft lockdown. We have hard lockdown. We have active shoes in the building. We have angry parents. You, know, you got chemical spills. You got plane crashes. You got tornado drills. You got earthquake drills. And you, you practice drills for everything. But nobody ever talks about what do you do if a student dies or worse yet, what do you do if a student who commits suicide there? This isn't a plan when you're training for that. Okay, Mr. Gavis, because it's just a terrible tragedy. We, we lost. If you go back to the video, the uh, main present thing here. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that one? What? Right now, the bottom of the screen at the suicide hotline. 
hotline number. Call that hotline. They will not pressure you. You don't have to give your name. They will talk to you. They will listen. There are people that care. There are resources out there. And it does get better. <coughs> Who are they talking about?